So good afternoon to everyone who has joined us live today. Good evening as well to some, uh, depending on your time zones. Uh, I'm, hope, I'm hopeful some of you would be joining us from Europe. Uh, my name is Nikhil, and I head the North American business for Vantage Circle. Vantage Circle is one of the fastest growing platforms globally for holistic employee engagement from employee rewards and recognition, workplace wellness, benefits and pulse surveys. Vantage Circle provides an intelligent, unified platform, and they've got close to 2 million active users. As a business, people in culture are what we're passionate about, and the experiences of the last 18 months have orchestrated the need to discuss topics we've often given less importance to. The be prepared for vocab times, and note there's a P in the bracket. We're trying to coin a new crisis term. Um, this webinar series is our attempt to be better prepared. In our third episode today, we're being joined by Pat Baders to talk about DE&I and empathy as critical workplace ingredients of the current times. But first, I'd like to introduce Pat to you all, uh, or attempt to introduce Pat. Uh, thank you, Pat, for joining us today. Pat currently serves as the Chief Talent Officer for Procore, the digital workflow company focused on improving the lives of everyone in construction. Um, that purpose, as well as Pat's long-term focus on building high-performing, healthy companies that scale, drives her vision to create amazing employee experiences for Procure's people across the world. Prior to joining Procure in November 2020, Pat was the Chief Talent Officer of ServiceNow, and prior to that, she was the Senior Vice President Global Talent Organization at LinkedIn, where her focus was on recruiting and developing top talent, driving organization transformation, supporting a highly engaged workforce and growing LinkedIn's global footprint. Uh, Pat has, and I can go on, uh, uh, also held human resources leadership positions in Plantronics, Yahoo, uh, Aligned Technology in Applied Materials. I come from that generation where I had a Yahoo email ID before a Gmail. So uh, this is fascinating. Uh, and of course, Pat earned her degree in business management uh, with a specialization in human resources management, uh, which is similar to mine uh, uh, from New Jersey. Uh, Pat also currently serves on the board of directors for Accolade and UKG, uh, the ultimate Kronos group. We know them very well. We end up integrating with them with a lot of our clients um, who use our uh, platform for wellness and recognition. So I am absolutely delighted to welcome you, Pat. Oh, thank you so much. Excited to be here. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so to begin with, right, I want to actually start with, uh, and today we're going to be talking about uh, DE&I uh, and uh, a special um, focus on empathy that's what we're going to bring in to uh, what we're going to bring to the forefront today in our discussion um, I would want to first you know start with uh, really understanding what DEI uh, which is diversity equity and inclusion what what does it mean in the workplace uh, obviously want to hear about uh, you know Pat's version of this but if I may I would want to just attempt and let you know uh, how I define that my own personal experience and uh, just like every, you know, human being should feel valued in life. Every employee should be valued at work. How an employer creates an organizational ecosystem where everyone feels valued and can thrive. So I'm saying ge and I is essentially the how to create a sustainable ecosystem where not just every employee, but every stakeholder feels valued, can thrive and succeed. That's my take. But I want to now invite Pat to come on and uh, add more meat to that. <laughs> I think you did it a great service. I I think the things I would add in, in my journey on this space is diversity is everything that makes you and I unique. Everything. The seen and the unseen, right? I'm an introvert. You wouldn't know that until I told you, right? Or you can see that I'm left-handed or that I'm represented as female, whatever those things may be. But diversity is everything that makes us unique. And then inclusion 
is the verb. It's kind of like the act of inviting you to the table fairly, right? It's respect, it's care, it's trying to reduce our biases when we do things fast. We know when we do things at speed, our biases run away sometimes on us. If we slow our neurological role, we can have a better, more fair process. And so that's the act of inclusion. And then I added the terminology of belonging to DNI when I was at LinkedIn because belonging is being authentically me, that sense that you care about me, like you said, that even when times are tough, I have a friend at work, I know that you're we're in it together. That psychological safety, that that empathy and compassion creates that sense of belonging. And then you've engaged both my brain and my heart, right? So DNI is in our brain, right? It's how we do things, how we, you know, the facts. And then belonging and empathy is the heart and how we show up. Excellent. I mean, that's, uh, so that's D, E, I, and B. Uh, yes, I know. I know. At Procore, we changed our acronym. So first I was DIBS, Diverse Inclusion and Belonging. And then uh, I met with my employees at Procore and they're like, can you add the E? Like equity really matters to us, like equity, not equal, equity. And so we rumbled on that a bit. And so now we're the the Dibby team, D-I-B-E. Like we're trying to figure it out because it's so personal. The space is so yeah. unique to me and to you that um, I want to be as co-creative and inclusive as I can be. And, and where does empathy come in? Is, is that the catalyst? Is that uh, uh, the driver? I mean, what is empathy? I, I hear of uh, um, um, a lot of uh, uh, experts, if I may call it, um, you know, talking about empathy as a leadership competency. I also hear about, you know, companies who say empathy is one of our organizational values. So what exactly is empathy? And where does that come in? And is is the E still equity or is the E transitioning to empathy or is it like a small E in the end? Uh, how do you put it together? Empathy is the catalyst for belonging and, and to create a healthy company. Like you, without empathy, it's going to be hard for you to fight the good fight, so to speak, and to really be on the journey. So here's how I was told what empathy was. And, and it, it's this old saying that a monk was climbing up a mountain. And as he's climbing up this mountain, he sees this, this gentleman. He is on the floor, on the, on the mountainside, and he's got a huge boulder on his chest. And so the monk feels this poor man's pain. He was like, oh, I'm struggling to breathe too. That's got to feel bad. I'm so sorry. That's empathy. I feel, I feel your pain. I can see the scenario. I, I start with, with feeling and care. Now, to really make a great company, you got to take, you got to start with that empathy to recognize the pain. And then you add action to fix it. That becomes compassion. So compassion is essentially empathy plus action. Without those two things together, um, we won't change the minds and hearts and create a healthier, more inclusive world. And so uh, empathy is that foundational step we have to recognize and see. And I think that for some of us, we have to hone the awareness and of, a, of empathy. I think some people walk through as a leader and, and don't realize the magic of em- empathy. I think if you teach them that empathy is something to really embrace and then to action when it makes sense, they will be phenomenal. And, and can someone be uh, empathetic to uh, a certain set of situations and not empathetic to a certain set of situations? Yes. I mean, I think that's the bias that creeps in, right? Because I lived a certain life, I might have more empathy for families that adopt, but maybe because I, I myself was, or I might have more for someone who lost a dog because I lost my dog. So if there's correlation in my life, empathy is going to be easier. The trick right. is to create empathy without the correlation in my own life, to seek, to be curious, like, why, why are you in pain? How are you? What is, what is happening with you and your family, your life, your work? Like, I, I want to understand your pain. I want to understand what's going on. And, and so therefore I can help, right? Um, right. It's being willing to ask those questions and be curious that you can hone an empathy broader than your own life experience. Great. Well, absolutely. I think you know, uh, after the pandemic, I think this has become more important than it was. Uh, I know a lot of 
companies have spoken about, you know, empathy being important even prior to it. But uh, was that more like just a, a value on the pin board? Uh, has it really come to action only now? And 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 what what have companies done? What did you do? You you went through this situation as a leader yourself. How did you? Uh, I mean, is it like you know one fine day? Hey, we're we're prepared. We're em- we're empathetic enough as an organization, or we're not. What do we do? How do we bring that in? And you're doing that, but you're also reacting to what's happening on the ground, right? So yeah. it's not like you have uh, you know prep time. No, 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 no prep time. I think empathy gets sped up if you have a common pain, like the pandemic shook everyone. There was no playbook, right? There wasn't a playbook. Uh, whether or not you were in retail and had to come into the front lines for as a healthcare worker or you're an office worker working from home for the first time, we didn't teach anyone how to navigate a pandemic in our generation. And so that unifying experience created higher empathy, right? We learned... Um, that more frequent check-ins with our employees, more frequent communication, what we know, what we didn't know, when we think we'll know things, helped ease anxiety. So mental health awareness went up. With that, empathy also went up. And what I hope, I really hope that post the pandemic, um, that we don't lose the high empathy that we've got gathered in the last two years. I hope we still check in with one another. I remember moments, early days of the pandemic, when we said, our uh, employees home, there was a new mom and she had a, a young toddler just beginning to walk. And she was trying to figure out a place to work in her home and, and have focus and, and, and not get so disrupted. And so she was hiding behind a couch with her laptop whispering. So her child would not find her because she did not have a place to hide. And so someone else said, Go to the closet. And they were like, why would she go to a closet? Well, if you have this kind of a closet, move all the clothes over. I'm actually in a closet. This is a picture, but look over here. And he turned the camera over and there was all of his clothes. And so he had empathy for her because he had four kids, I think. I think we learned to be human, understand the pain and the awkwardness, and that empathy keeps blossoming. And out of that empathy comes innovation and care and really cool things and friendships and thriving to your point earlier. No, absolutely. And I think uh, I want to just pick on that point where you said that out of empathy comes innovation because I, I've done this program uh, with uh, actually a Fortune 500 manufacturing company uh, based out of Wisconsin, actually. And they wanted to create an ecosystem of uh, innovation. So uh, a culture of innovation, an ecosystem where innovation thrives every day. Now, the key word here is the everyday, because here's a company who came and said, you know what, a couple of years ago, we hired a chief innovation officer. We've got innovation directors. We've got a whole department. So we're high on innovation. And then we said, okay, uh, what percentage of your workforce ha- has contributed to innovation in the last one year? And don't, don't worry about the answer. They didn't even know. They didn't even track that. They didn't even know. So um, if every employee is not participating or if a large percentage of your workforce is not participating, you don't have that ecosystem that promotes, uh, uh, you know, uh, innovation or a culture of innovation where everyone wants to innovate or contribute to improvement. And then we actually went back and said, okay, where do we start? And I said, before you do anything, you can bring ideation tools and you can create, you know, uh, we, we, call, we, we coined a word that I call innovators which are like the senior subject matter experts would come and mentor some of those raw ideas. All of that comes later, but you have the right value system. Do you have values that promote innovation? And then we did this exercise. We said, what values promote innovation? And the top one was empathy. Mm-hmm. Right? Empathy, so, psychological safety also helps with innovation too. Absolutely. So, and and which is why you know why I I wanted to actually ask you is, is empathy something that should be on your list of organizational values? Do you believe yeah. it should be? Is it there today? Um, I did a little Google search and I found that you know I, I did you know, what are the most common organizational values and empathy didn't come up. No, it'll show up more as a competency, a leadership trait, not as a cultural value. They'll right. they'll say innovate right? Or they'll say customer first, that means you solve problems, right? That, um, but I think if you look at the leadership attributes, leadership of others, leadership of self, 
you know, figure out how to create a healthy team. Part of that is empathy and compassion, right? And so they're yeah. leaving it that way, but I don't think they're emphasizing it enough. Yeah. And, and, and maybe that's the way, because I, I am one of those, I'm an advocate of empathy should be one of your values. And, and just at that point, uh, uh, for, for uh, uh, our participants today, I just want to put up a quick poll, which is just on these lines. I want to see what they have to say. And then, uh, so I'm going to just put this up here. We can take 60 seconds to answer this. It would go up now. Can you all see it? Okay. Yes. So we're basically asking, is empathy either directly or indirectly one of your company values? Uh, and I, I have uh, the, uh, the opportunity to, to see the responses coming in live. So I can see how this is moving. This is interesting. Uh, but since only I have that and not the others, this is not inclusive. So I should not talk about it. <laughs> Uh, let's give it, uh, just a few more seconds. I'm just going to end this poll now and I'm going to share the results on your screen here. So what do you, what do you say, Pat? Yeah, I don't think I'm surprised. None of the values promote empathy at the workplace. I think it's too buried. I think, it, um, they don't understand without empathy, you cannot create psychological safety and compassion in an organization. You cannot lead a healthy team. Anxiety and burnout and engage employees without empathy. Why chase the magic of employee engagement without empathy? It doesn't make sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, well, thank you, participants, uh, for for answering this. I am an advocate, and and, and Patrick, she is as well. That empathy should be uh, either directly or indirectly one of your company values, because that's what that's where it all all starts, right? Uh, so now the the next uh, you know part that I would want to go into that is to understand how do you can you train for empathy. I think you can make empathy sensitivity training. Like, what is it? Why does empathy matter? You know, how do you build empathy for others? And so you got to first look internally for self to, before you can see it in others. Like what, you know, remind yourself of your life's journey when you struggled, when your loved one struggled. How did they struggle? Who came to help them? You would have not gotten that help if it wasn't for the foundation of empathy. And so think about those moments when empathy helped your life and then think how you can provide empathetic support for others. And when have you done that for your family or friends? And then can you do it at work? And why would that be good at work? I think you need to, to first personalize it before you can bring it outward. Right. And, and so, so basically we're saying we would need to create uh, content, stories, uh, champions, internal champions, could this actually be more of, or I wouldn't say more of, but something that Intel Communications would equally partner uh, with HR on rather than just, just being, because oh, yes. it's not exactly just learning, right? No, no, no. Um, and storytelling, by the way, is our best gift as human beings. If you tell a story, your personal story, beginning, middle, and end, it releases chemicals in our brains. It creates that empathy. It creates understanding and it creates a community. And so if, if these chemicals are triggered, you create a tighter team and a healthier company. So definitely tell stories, make them personal, right? Own your story. The more detailed, the better, right? Um, and it gives a sense of what to expect in the organization and gives role models for others and why this is magical. So yes. And then if you have a leader that has demonstrated great empathy and compassion, created innovation, then explain why, how, why do they pursue this? And they can, because they, some people get confused. Is this a moral obligation that we have to care for each other? Or is this really a business imperative? I think it's both. Yeah. So you're also saying in a way that, you know, uh, the stories that you tell should be authentic. So high on authenticity. 
because that's what uh, you know employees would would buy into, right? So uh, and and what else? I mean, uh, what else could uh, companies do? And and I want to move away from you know just empathy and look at the DEI uh, holistically, but just to kind of complete this part, what else could uh, companies and employers and HRs and basically leaders do? Of course, you know, we're saying walk the talk. Uh, we're saying uh, collaborate with internal communications to tell stories, you know, maybe have a podcast or a channel on this, keep it going. We're saying make it a value, uh, uh, you know, either indirectly or directly. But is, is there any other area where you could kind of bring this in? Uh, kick off your staff meetings with either gratitude or a check-in. How are you feeling? You know, how are you entering this meeting? You know, from a scale of one to 10, 10 being fully engaged, ready, or one really distracted, something's happening in your life. And, you know, it's hard for you to be mentally present today. Give us a sense of where you are, right? And and how can we help? And so, it, or if you're practicing gratitude, I, I did this for years. It is gratitude professional and personal. So I'd start like, I'm grateful my dad turned 93 this year. Um, he survived a, a hip replacement at almost 90 and he got to see me speak for the first time in my career, just like a couple months ago at 93, like incredible. I'm super grateful for that. And then I'll say my gratitude for, you know, this team inside Procore that, you know, really helped me launch a program on development and I couldn't, it took a village and here's why I'm grateful for them. So if you practice gratitude as part of your staff check-in before you even start operationalizing anything, you get to know people. You get to know about my dad. You get to know about this amazing team that helped achieve greatness and really work together. You, you get to know each other at a more human level. Those are easy things for you to do, and it creates higher connection at a human level. And that is the foundation with empathy, diversity, inclusion, and belonging. Like You need that human connection. Absolutely. Now, you know, again, from from the you know from from your position, the position that you have as a leader of talent and human resources, right? Uh, and and again, in in this post pandemic environment, right, a strong DNI practice can most significantly impact what? What What do you think uh, it would be? Just uh, a growth mindset will start to happen naturally. Growth mindset means that I'm willing to learn and listen because you come at this problem so uniquely, so different than me, that in the discussion, in the discovery, I get smarter. So diversity makes us smarter because I will not have a you know preconceived idea. You and I talk the same way, understand the same language, approach the same business problem the same way. Therefore, when we come and propose something, I'm going to be more thorough in my research. I'm going to do my due diligence and then I will get smarter through that journey. So diversity of thoughts and, and approaches makes all of us smart. Let's just align on that one. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And absolutely. And, and the fact, like you said that, you know, if we're all similar, then uh, let's, let's, let's look at an employee life cycle, right? Uh, you know, the recruitment is the first thing that comes to your mind, right? How important is DE and I or, the practice of DNI being part of your DNA important for you know healthy recruitment practice. Not not only that you're being an equal employment, uh, you know, uh, uh, company. You're giving that opportunity, but like you said, you'll get smarter people, people with diverse views and opinions. Yes, right? and yeah, and there's amazing talent, all demographics. All of them, right? So I want the biggest, most complex sets of talent possible to come in to be a, to be like an amazing soup or a stew, amazing recipe for my organization because I know we'll slow down to understand each other. I know that we'll learn along the way and that learning just gets faster. And so if you have a growth mindset, Carol DeWick's book, Mindset is an amazing. So you should read that if you haven't, but it... It gives us permission not to know everything today. It says, I haven't learned it yet. So in a debate, someone could have a different point of view and, and I can, it's not my point of view, but maybe if I learn more, I, I will grow and I might form a different opinion. Maybe together in our debate, we'll actually be stronger together because we're willing to listen to something. Because I haven't 
finished it yet. I haven't finalized it yet. I'm not perfect yet. And in that yet word, I'm listening and right. and I'm asking questions. That is what you want. And if you do it in an authentic way, if you do it inclusively, making sure and like literally asking ourselves, what voice is missing around this table, right? If you're building a product for someone that um, cannot see, then you're going to be thinking about the blind person and how you're putting, you know, audio into the software. We have to think about our customers being widely diverse around the world. So we should have that same diversity in the product development life cycle. We should have that same diversity in the sales motion. Because in the absence of that, the buyer or the person receiving the product, like that wasn't really meant for me. That wasn't designed by someone like me. They don't under, they don't have the empathy on what it means right. not to see. Right. No. So, and, and, you know, while that is so important that, and, and I'm going to play devil's advocate that that also creates a big problem for you. So if you start, you know, only hiring uh, people with diverse backgrounds and skill sets, uh, competencies, views and attitudes, uh, aren't you making it a bigger problem for yourself to manage? And at oh. what point do you say that, you know, X and I don't know. So uh, I, I want to ask you, are there any metrics or any benchmark data to say that, 60% diversity or 70% diversity is ideal. Anything beyond that is, is an even bigger headache. Do you get what I'm saying? <laughs> yes. So Gartner has a um, a scale, right? A, a fully homogenous team, even if it's all women or all people of color, whatever that homogeny is, will not perform as well as a diverse one. And so what you're looking for is a tipping point. You want at least... diversity in a team. So their voices aren't shut down. That's a, so there's a threshold that you kind of want to have. And so, and, and there's truth. If there's only one person that's other being interviewed, that other person will never get hired. So even in your hiring pipeline, you need enough diversity to increase the chances of someone different than me will be hired. So first off, you have a threshold. You must achieve that. Now, your question is provocative. Is it too much of a problem to have everyone different? Shouldn't there be some commonality? Well, I can be different, but if we align on the purpose and mission of an organization, that punches through everything, right? We can be completely, wildly, amazingly different, but we are aligned in our values, aligned in the purpose and the mission of this company. And therefore, we're going to bring our diversity, our differences to bear for fruit, right? We will, and it's slower. It's harder to manage. I agree. It's harder to recruit for. It takes longer cycle time. I understand that's painful, but the reward in those things outweigh not doing it. Right. Absolutely. I think if you don't have a strong uh, DEI practice, or if it's not part of your DNA, then, uh, you know, even if you, you know, hire and maintain that perfect ratio, uh, how are you going to retain people? Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, so, so that's I, I think yeah, you're you're absolutely bang on to say that uh, if if everyone's aligned and you know if the the culture has been appropriately uh, built and proliferated, then we don't really have to worry about uh, the threshold on the other side. So you know, like we're saying, so thirty percent is a minimum. There is no maximum, right? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, it it's a trade-off, right? It's it's getting the best talent. So I have two, you know, people that look alike, two people of color, two females, two people that have lost a limb, two people that I mean that's fine, but I mean you don't want to you want enough diversity in that team to create natural tension and dialogue for curiosity yeah. and innovation to thrive. Absolutely. And and just at that point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, you know, throw up uh, the second poll uh, in which we're going to ask in post-pandemic times, a strong DNI practice can most significantly impact which of the following uh, functional areas. Uh, and then I would want to get, uh, let's get in the answers and then I'm just going to launch this. And after that, Pat, I would want to get your view on each one of these, right? And how would you tackle each one of these? Uh, the poll's on. I 
did did it go on? Because it's yes. on, but I haven't seen. Oh yes, now the responses are coming in now. And there's also a question that's come on, Pat, which is someone's asked to you have the Gartner study regarding that 30% threshold. Is that something that's available? I'll see if I can grab it. Okay. And we're going to give it another 15 seconds. I still have the unfair advantage to see where it's trending. All right, and I'm going to close this now. I'm going to show the results. I wish I could answer this. I can't. <laughs> the 71% of respondents have said that an increased workplace innovation driven by inclusion of diverse opinions and ideas is what the EI can significantly impact. And this obviously means growth, Right. Uh, so business growth is what would come. Uh, now, goal alignment is actually the lowest answered option here, but uh, wouldn't, wouldn't these be uh, connected in some format? Because if there isn't better goal alignment driven by uh, empathetic workplace DNA, uh, would you be able to innovate? You will innovate, yes, but would you innovate in a path that is desirable, in areas that are aligned with your business? Yeah, I think the question was, which one most significantly impacts? Significantly, of course, of course. No, so that definitely brings that out, uh, but uh, do you, what, what would you have answered? Um, I, you know what? It impacts all four, to your point. I think that ultimately impacts the ability to hire top talent that creates the innovation. And when you do that and they have a sense of belonging, that you do reduce the attrition. And because they know how to debate, they're used to the conversation being differing and rumbling on it, like Brene Brown would say, you get better goal alignment. So I think this is a virtual circle. <laughs> right, right. No, absolutely. But is, is this what you, is this uh, the, the trend that you would have expected? I, I was actually expecting that uh, the first option would have seen the most because along with the pandemic, we're also encountering another phenomenon, which is called the great resignation. Yes. I call it yeah. the great migration. I think they're not all of them are resigning to retire. I think they're migrating somewhere else because they've spent time to figure out their joy, right? Their values, their purpose, and they're aligning on that. Right. Great. Fantastic. So uh, back to our topic on uh, DNI and really uh, from a perspective that how do you uh, drive and build that into, into your DNA? Uh, I what start areas of people and culture and management should companies be looking to invest into? in the next year? Well, I think that if they believe in the hypothesis that diverse teams outperform homogenous teams, and there's a lot of studies besides the Gartner study, I think BlackRock looked at their te high-performing teams, biggest revenue-generating teams in their investment, and it was the most diverse teams, won. like they became the alpha team. And so if we believe that to be true, and we believe that differing of opinions makes us smarter, that helps the company grow and thrive, then I would say create a sense of belonging in the organization so you attract more diverse people. Because diverse people, if you're, if you're in the minority, if you're other and you can survive but you won't thrive, you're looking for an organization, a culture that has empathy, compassion, right, that I can be me. And so therefore I can get psychological safety and therefore I can contribute to the debate. If I don't have a sense of belonging, 
I won't have psychological safety and therefore innovation is stunted. So yes, you can have diversity, but without the sense of belonging, you won't unlock that magic. So you can have all those, you know, crazy, wonderful, diverse people around your table, but if they're all quiet, you're kind of lost. So start with belonging. What does belonging mean? Now, What's fascinating, there's a lot of studies on that as well. Belonging is genetically wired in the human species. We are, we are compelled to belong to a community for survival. So if you think back, back, you know, millennial, it is about hunters and gatherers and nurturers. Like we each came in those cavemen days kind of thing with different roles. That's why genetically there's introverts and extroverts too. Genetically, we're wired to be different. But we're compelled to come together because we have strength in numbers. If I have enough hunters, I can cook the food, I can nurture the food, I can have the babies, I can protect the family. And so at work, we need diversity at work. We need diversity of styles and approach. But if you are in fear, if you don't have empathy and compassion and you don't embrace what makes me different, then I'm going to be quieter. You won't get the best out of me. And sometimes I will mask who I am. So in some cultures, you know, it's illegal to be gay. It is frowned upon if you're a female working. It is blank. You know, you name it. If they're in threat for family or life, livelihood, they will pretend they have a whole different family. They will pretend other things so you will never get to know who they are. And that energy they're spending to mask who they are, to fit in, is wasted energy they could apply to create things at work, amazing products, amazing processes, amazing care for your customers. And so there there are studies about that. So storytelling, going back to storytelling, Professor Greg Walton at Stanford did a study on the uncertainty and moves, becoming a parent, getting married, new job. Those are like your top four moments of uncertainty. And if you can tell me a story or show me people that look like me that went through similar experiences, not only survived and thrived, then I will write my own story and have better optimism going through. And so he noted that with young men of color that he studied originally, that if he showed them other men that went through a a majority white university, if they saw people like them and learned about their journey and what worked for them, uh, their confidence went up and not only did their GPAs improved, their graduation rates improved, but they made friends. I love that, right? I love that. So I want to laugh and enjoy the journey at work, not just the work product. And having friends at work helps you with that. So storytelling, human, authentic is really, really important to unlock inclusion and, and diversity because if you have a diverse team, they'll teach you how to be more inclusive. Right. And has, and you you speak about the human touch there, but has remote working actually been an obstacle to creating that environment? I mean, Uh, I know you can tell stories, you can do podcasts, and you can, you know, do webinars, but it's still not the same. It's not the same. Therefore, we have to be really intentional with bringing the human to work. So a a trick that I did with my team is I, we did a scavenger hunt. We had a staff meeting. We we're going to do some strategy plan and we're going to be on the, on the video zoom for three hours. But I took 30 minutes out and I said, all right, get an object that's at your desk at home right now. That means something to you. Then come back on zoom. You have five minutes, find that object, come back on zoom. And then I want you to do show and tell why that object means something to you. What's the story behind that object and why of all the real estate space you have on your limited desk, why you keep that one in front and center. And so it was amazing. We saw paintings that someone's grandmother did. We saw, you know, children's paintings. We saw like an award that meant so much to somebody. Someone got citizenship somewhere. Like it was just like amazing life stories on their desk. Like who knew? And then we said, all right, great. Now take those objects. We're going to break you off into teams of three or four people And you're going to be on a deserted island and you're going to use that object, either survive and thrive on that island together or escape the island, get back home. You guys decide, y'all decide what you want to do, but come back in about five, 10 minutes and tell us how creative you were. So not only do we share our human story, but we we made them co-create a solution by coming at things so differently because they had different objects. So it was a, we tried to encapsulate what could be great in, in being so different and so cool and human. So try those things. 
Try not to have a digital background. Invite people to your home. You're in my home, right? I had more people in my home in the last two years than I would ever imagine in my life. And so you'll see my, my family come by or an animal come by or disruption of whatever reason. Like you're living my life with me in a little bit. Like I don't want to hide all of that. Now, sometimes if my house is messy, I will do a digital thing every now and then. But I think we have to embrace living and who we are and, and, um, lean into that. Excellent. I think that that's an excellent, uh, initiative. I'm certainly going to do that. And then, uh, uh, I'll be able to match up with my daughter because she keeps coming and telling me, you know, we did, sh- you know, show and tell, I need to take this toy to school. Uh, and I'm like, what is this thing about? I've never done that. <laughs> so no, I, I think it's fantastic. You have to, uh, uh, you know, cross over those uh, digital hurdles. Uh, there's a question that has come up. Clay is asking, uh, could Kat, Pat elaborate on the comment on the great migration? Yeah. So there's a lot of articles about the great resignation. People are quitting and you see higher attrition in different pockets. And for sure, right. You'll see higher attrition in recruiters or HR because the talent side of the house has been under a lot of strain, like we've never been chief medical officers or, you know, vaccination gurus. So we've, we've tried to figure out how to serve and how to, how to help. And so depending on if your natural pattern would have been, you would have resigned last year because you've been in the company five years and you wanted something else because the pandemic you held off, right? So there's like this bottled up migration of talent that wants to try and experiment and do something new. We're kind of flushing through that. There's another piece of that migration that is happening that if you listen carefully, you will learn that it's because the employee doesn't feel like they're aligned with your purpose and or your values, right? They want full flexibility. They've actually figured out working from home if they can is the right thing. We've had people leave Apple, for example, because Apple's mandating everyone comes into the office. But if you like walking your daughter to school in the morning, if you like taking that yoga class at noon down the block with your neighbors, whatever it was that you found your rhythm while on this, you know, lockdown approach, working remote approach, that's for you. And so you're going to look for companies that embrace the way you work. And we have to figure out ways to embrace that. For example, Slack gives you uh, an out of office icon or I'm sick icon, but not I'm not working icon. Like, can we say I'm not working on my email? Can we say that I'm sending this email out when it's convenient for me and my time zone, but you can respond when it's convenient and on your time zone? Can we be more human in how we interact with technology and teach each other? Those organizations that do that will get better inflows of talent that fit them. And so the migration's happening because we've been doing soul searching for about 18 months almost two years. And we're going to decide what matters. If compensation matters, you might seek that. If it is flexibility, you'll seek that. If it's values and empathy and compassion, a diverse workforce, you'll seek those things out. But we know life's short and we know we want to be happy and we want to enjoy the journey. And so that's where they're migrating to. This is actually then... uh... You know, the way you call it, this is something which is, which can happen even, even if you don't have a pandemic. So two or three years, four years later, this can happen again. You don't need a pandemic for this to happen, right? Uh, We're getting wiser. And talent, talent is choosing where and how they want to work now. Like never before. If you think about the nine to five was an industrial age revolution mindset. It was typically men left home to work. They, they left, their spouse took care of the children, the food. They came home for dinner. That's why it was at five o'clock. They came home for dinner. Now with both parties, a lot of them working, the, the people like to code at night, in the middle of the night. They like to sleep during the day. There's way more flexibility in how we work as long as we're productive. So you see productivity. How do you measure productivity? All that becoming more of an innovation layer on technology, especially human capital management systems and tools. Yeah. But People are deciding how they want to work and you either hire them or you don't. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and I just uh, wanted to let all our attendees know that, you know, you can keep uh, typing in your questions uh, now. 
Uh, we're still going to have uh, uh, some conversations with Pat, but you know, feel free to type in your questions that you have, uh, you know, specifically. Now, I've learned something new called uh, the Great Migration. I that's that's another version of what I heard from uh, Gary Ridge, and he calls it the Great Escape. Uh, uh -huh. And 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 it's funny, but that's in, into some. Uh, to some extent, it is similar because when he's talking about the escape, right? Your, uh, it's it's kind of I I do see similar or commonality between um, how you defined the Great Migration, right? Uh, but yeah, that's that's another. So there are three versions now that we have. Uh, but the Great Resignation, I don't know by whom. Uh, we have the Great Migration by Pat, and then we have uh, the Great Escape by Gary. <laughs> so. <laughs> I think the great escape is is the actual great retirement. People leaving the workforce altogether to retire. That's the great escape. <laughs> yeah, I'm 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 going to ask him about this cuz Gary's going to be our guest on uh uh our seventh episode, so uh yeah, it would be interesting. I'm going to tell him about the great migration and see what he has to what's his opinion on that. Please. Uh, I would uh, in, in my last segment, I want to talk a little more about uh, specific organizational initiatives that you could do to inject, uh, you know, uh, a stronger DEI practice. Um, and the first thing that, uh, you know, comes to my mind, and also because I am a very strong advocate of employee recognition, and that's, that's really my expertise, uh, I think employee recognition can play a very, very significant role uh, in creating a strong practice. What do you think? Yes. I, I, what was interesting when the pandemic hit and all the uncertainty was upon us, the thing I relied on over and over again was old school situational leadership, right? So what works for you? What are your motivators? What's your personal purpose, professional one? Um, how, how do you like to work and how do you like to be recognized and appreciated? Like I you go back to the human in front of you and figure those things out together and what really matters and then lead in that way. Um, it's more complex. It's not one size fits all, but I know a lot of companies have thrown a lot of compensation at the problem, but that didn't solve appreciation. And so I, for one, I um, at Procore, I, I don't have that large of a team, but I have close to a hundred. And so I took about, I asked my, my managers and I said, give me the names of employees that you want me to send a personal note to. I'm going to handwrite it. I'll mail it. I'll take care of all of it, but you have to give me the details on why you're grateful for them and what they've achieved. And so I, we filled out a spreadsheet and I must've mailed 30 note cards and handwritten with the highlights and why I'm super excited, why they're on the team and, and where I see the impact of those projects. I knew most of them, thankfully. And I signed it by me and the manager. My employees started photos. Yeah, those cards were showing up on Slack, on their Facebook pages, because it detailed, like, you did this thing. You've impacted our employees' lives in incredible ways. Like, you helped our managers do this. You've onboarded the largest orientation class in our history and your net promoter score was the highest we've ever seen. Like, how'd you do it? Like mm -hmm. I was very clear on the recognition and that meant more to so many of those employees than if I were to give them a spot bonus. No, absolutely. And I think it's also, you know, uh, uh, and we've, we've seen uh, a change in the construct and design of recognition frameworks altogether. Uh, and especially, and we, we, when we talk about uh, how do you bring in DEI into your recognition framework, it's about um, is your recognition framework uh, there for everyone, every diverse individual to participate in, right? Or are there biases within that? Then are you able to recognize a diverse set of outcomes and behaviors and you know, values being demonstrated? Uh, so, you know, uh, is it is it diverse from a perspective that diverse set of individuals are able to participate in a fair manner? Are diverse set of outcomes and values being, 
you know, recognize. Uh, and I say that because we had a few, um, some, some programs that we looked at and we re-engineered where we saw that 80% of the recognitions were still for anything that got, you know, well, a customer appreciation. So do you get what I'm saying? It's, it's not, I, I don't call that diverse. It's cute, right? It is still coming from the fact that, okay, if your customer like what you did, right, you're going to get the recognition badge, you're going to get the spot award or, uh, you know, uh, any of those. But um, that's not really how it should be. And I think what we've learned is uh, uh, there is a role for uh, diversity within the construct of recognition programs and then uh, and obviously the, the inclusiveness and the belongingness. So it's about the construct and it's also about the delivery of the recognition, right? Uh, the emotional connect that comes in. And that's where the inclusiveness uh, comes in. And, and we, we try and do that uh, uh, in the way that we, we design our programs. The um, What's interesting is that with diversity of the program, yeah. the people that we hire, and how do we do all that? It's, it's you've just got to stay agile because it changes all the time. Right. You just got to be agile on how you approach problems and you approach innovation, you approach process. But agility in this journey is worth its weight in gold because there's no yeah. one size. Absolutely. Is so. Uh, and and uh, I want to just throw up our you know last poll and take a few questions. Uh, but uh, uh, again, I want to ask you, Pat, right, amongst uh you know, some of the initiatives that we spoke about, if there is one that you think companies should invest in, actually take out budget and say, we're going to invest in uh, auditing our value system and, you know, seeing if uh, it is going to drive empathy, d and I, or we're going to invest in uh, learning and storytelling, uh, or we're going to invest in... Uh, Performance management, I mean, should empathy even be a KPI is, is a question uh, when you look at uh, your employee appraisal. So uh, I want to hear uh, what your views are. And then I have a similar question that I'm going to throw up uh, for everyone to answer. I'd be curious how you do an, a KPI around empathy, by the way, because you can be <laughs> empathetic without impact. So it's you got to walk. That's true. Point. You have to have a combination of things on that. I... So we what I try KPI, to but what I mean to say is when you're when you're doing a performance review, right, would you give attention to uh has this individual practiced empathy or has he been empathetic towards his colleagues, towards clients, towards situations? Yes, I would um that's the both the what and the how. Did you deliver on the goals and then how did you do that? And then the how is to model your values and or leadership expectations of which empathy should be part of that. Like, did you solve? Did you have compassion? Did you take action with the empathy? Um, that That's super, super important. I think that, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. I think, and, and the performance management side of it is really tricky because if you do performance, I like to talk about performance engagement or performance enablement, not management, because I I'll, I've been in front of hundreds of people and I go, who likes to be managed and not a hand stays up. And I'm like, I don't like to be managed either. I'm like probably the worst employee ever, but I like to, to dance with you. I'd like to co-create with you. I'd like to build together with you. Right. And I will take guidance, but I don't want to be quote managed. And so if you can give me feedback to make me a better version of me and help me achieve my goals and my values, I'm in. Right. And so I think language matters in all of this significantly. The words we choose are really, really important in the journey. And I think in how you recognize people and appreciate them, the more detailed, the more human, right, the more adapted to their desires in terms of their approach, the more impactful it will be. Absolutely. Uh, and here goes the last of the questions for today. It's on, should be on your screens now. Uh, and it's the same question that I asked Pat. Uh, think of 2022. You want to promote empathy uh, or maybe just DEI uh, as a whole. What would you like to see your company invest in? 
and yeah, the questions, the answers are coming in. Yeah, and I don't think we're going to get an answer for the last option because, like you rightly said, man, empathy cannot be a performance indicator. Uh, so uh, spot on on that. Thank you for correcting that. But I, I think uh, the essence was to say that do we talk about empathy in our performance reviews? Uh, and is that something that we should, right? Yeah, I think it's um, especially for leadership, right? Did you lead it with empathy and compassion? Right? Did you solve the problems that your employees raised? Were you, you servant leadership means you have empathy and compassion. You cannot be a servant leader without that. And hey. so it's it's a foundational skill set to build and to nurture. Great. And that's what our audience have said. Uh all 50% say increase training ours on dealing with empathy at work. So uh I think, you know, the human resources and corporate communication teams need to shake hands because this is something that they need to do together. Um, and yeah, uh, people would like to see policies and practices being re-engineered to remove reduced biases, which basically is also an acceptance that uh, today's policies and practices do have certain biases uh, in them. Uh, well, this is the view, and uh, and then of course uh, recognition programs that appreciate acts of empathy. Uh, again, brings me back to the same thing. If if you want to do that, think about uh, empathy as a a core value. Because if it's a core value, and you can ask people to demonstrate that, and then you can recognize that. Uh, so that's uh, that's what I would say. Uh, uh, it's been an amazing conversation, Pat. I have learned so much. I just want to throw up. I've made some points as you spoke. Some of my takeaways, uh, uh, diversity is everything that makes us unique. I just love the way you kind of, you know, put that across. Uh, add belonging and empathy. Empathy is the catalyst. So we're talking about uh, DEIB or maybe D D E B I Debbie. Debbie is easier to remember for yeah. me. <laughs> Debbie, yeah. Debbie is easier for me to remember. Um, compassion is empathy plus action. Use storytelling to train on empathy. Um, and yeah, when you're saying increase training hours, but use storytelling. Don't do boring, uh, you know, instructor-led sessions where uh, there's just someone talking. Uh, and if they're talking, they should be telling stories, right? Yes. Uh, create great role models. Uh Make them personal, you know, that the emotional connect would come from there. Uh, the synergies need to be felt uh, when you tell stories. Uh, check in frequently. Kick off meetings with a token of gratitude. Uh, that's that's a great, great learning. Uh, I've put a double tick on that because I'm going to uh, use that myself. Uh, and, of course, diversity makes us smarter. So, you know. Uh, it's a blanket statement to say that everything else falls in place. If you start appreciating the fact that diversity makes us smarter, uh, we said that at least 30% uh, diversity in your company, that's like a minimum uh, threshold so that voices are heard. There is no upper threshold. Uh, uh, doesn't make sense, right? Uh, learn how to deal with uh, uh, with that diversity. Uh, those are uh, some of uh, my takeaways. So if there are any questions that anyone has, uh, you can still send that to us. And uh, even if we can't answer those today, we can certainly. Pat, can we send you if there are any other questions? We can just yes. send it on email. Uh, okay. And and to just uh, any comments from you, any you know closing uh, statements. I just appreciate anyone on the journey. Right. Seeking to understand this and to lean into the what and the how is an imperative, I think, in the world and keeping empathy and care and action in, in the front, being perfectly imperfect, though we may be, it's the right progress. 
Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I look forward to uh, speaking with you soon again. And uh, I think after Gary's session, maybe we should we should do one where we have both you and Gary on. Well, the Great Escape that. and the Great Migration. And let's see where that leads us. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We've got our next... Uh, uh, webinar on Thursday with uh, Tracy Sonberg. So see you all there. Thanks, Pat. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.